Right. Welcome, everybody. Our two two guides through the holiday, or our 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 uh, all of our guides through the holiday start with um, the letter M. Moses, Maimonides, Madonna. Um, okay. Um, let's begin, and um, and we're going to today do something I've been wanting to do for um, a long time, which is to. Uh, which is, to, which is to look into your hearts, which is to look at the heart. Um, to look at the heart in the Torah, in Hebrew, in the Bible, to, to, to consider um, the meaning um, of, 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 of the heart and of the word heart, which is um, some of you probably already know, um, not exactly the, the the same as as our English word for heart. That's obvious, right? Everything's always translated, but also um, also used in ways that are that are sometimes surprising, um, given the way that we use the heart. And 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 think about it for a sec. The way we use the the word heart is strange, also because we're referring to an organ that pumps blood throughout the body, and and, and also to the the kind of the emotional seat of our consciousness and that doesn't i think are we are we i think we all know that you don't actually feel things with that organ though it does you maybe it, you know you feel it in your chest so maybe there part of what i want us to do is think why do we use these organs these terms all together um but um but in hebrew it, it's more complicated than that because um as we will soon see the heart is not simply a an emotional um, reference point. Uh, first of all, um, it's you know it, it's used anatomically differently, right? But it, but but also I think it's used psychically differently. Okay, and, and I and I will and I want to say um, also that I've been thinking about this since I heard an interview with or uh, it was a class some recording of um, Ram Das Baba Ram Das um, uh, uh, giving fourth teaching um, one of the kind of the great Western um, spiritual teachers of, of the of the the 60s and 70s but also one of the kind of translators of of Hindu thought in in uh, in in this country and I I remember hearing him in the sort of the same lecture early on saying you know what do, do you know what his name was Ram Das some people know what his name was Rich, Richard Alpert right nice Nice Jewish boy, and I remember him saying very, um, very clearly that uh, that he got nothing from his Jew. He was born Jewish, but he got nothing from his Jewish upbringing, right? And I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hate on him for that. It, it, it clearly just he got nothing from it. There was nothing there. Um, it's a sad thing, um, but it's true. And he certainly his destiny was elsewhere. I mean, he certainly did great things in 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 a different spiritual tradition. But then later in that same lecture, I remember him saying, um, you know, in Sanskrit, the word for heart, it's not just the heart, it's also like the mind, the consciousness, the, 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 the spiritual tradition and the, and the Sanskrit language is much more complex and capacious than the way that we um, speak about the heart in, in, in English. And I remember hearing that and thinking like, ah, oh, you know, like, what a shame. This guy who got nothing from his Jewish upbringing missed and, 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 and so embraced a, 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 in, in, in indeed a, a rich and, and complex spiritual, spiritual tradition, missed some of the richness and the complexity that was really in his own backyard. Um, and um, because some of the things that he was saying about heart, I think we'll find to be true about the heart um, as it is used in the Torah, in the, in the Tanakh. So, um, so let's begin that. Today's class will be in some ways just a kind of um, like a, a kind of poetics class. Like we'll be thinking about just like the, the usage, the, the valence, the meaning, the, the shades of this word as it is. And we only have an hour and it is a word that is used a lot, right? As this isn't one of my famous tricks. So like, it's only used three times in the Bible. Here they are. It's used a lot. It's used all over the way. We won't be able to cover it all. But one of the most prominent places and one of the places I wish Ram Das um, could, uh, I wish I could study with Ram Das is in this week's Torah portion, 
um, Parshat Ki Tavo. So first of all, let me give you the um, source sheet. And um, then uh, let me give you a little bit of the context. So we've been in Deuteronomy for a while now. And as you, you probably know, Deuteronomy is this long speech that Moses is giving to the people. They're on the verge of entering into the land and Moses isn't going to go with them. So he gives them this long, um, I think you call it hortatory, right? Like sort of instructional, this is what you should do. This is what you should think. This is what I want to tell you, long speech. And um, in this week's part, and it's often very harsh. Moshe is very harsh with the people. And in this week's Parsha, in, in some ways, he's the harshest of all because we have another, we had this back in Leviticus, but we have another tochacha, another um, admonition, another threat. And the threat it comes in the form of curses. So as usual, and, and it's a bit of a bummer, um, the Torah gives a few blessings. Here's some stuff that will be good if you do the right thing. And then like three times the amount of curses. Here's some terrible stuff if you do the wrong thing. And it's really terrible stuff. If you look in chapter 28, you'll see there's just, um, just really horrifying um, parents eating their children. That's the first time we see that image. I mean, just really uh, terrible stuff. So Moses' last, like, you better watch out message is in chapter 28. And then um, at the end of chapter eight, as if to tell us that something is changing, something is shifting, um, the chapter ends, these are the terms of the covenant, which the eternal commanded Moses to conclude or to seal with the Israelites in the land of Moab, in addition to the covenant which God had made with them at Chorev on Mount Sinai. So that's interesting. It's like there was a covenant of Sinai, and, then, and Moses is, is now with this, this new generation, 40 years later, forging a new covenant. Like, in other words, making sure they're on board with the old covenant, with, all, with some additions. And so Moses is trying to get them in the right um, state of mind, or state of heart, uh, maybe, is the best way to put it. Um, because then we head into chapter 29, it's the end of Parshat Kitabo, there's one last um, paragraph. And um, in it, there's this famous phrase, which I want to spend our time today thinking about, um, of lev ladat, a knowing heart. Okay, so to take a look at the way that it is used here. Uh, okay, so Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Eternal did before your very eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all of his courtiers and to his whole country. The wondrous feats that you saw with your own eyes, those prodigious signs and marvels. I just want to say they did not see those things. The whole point is that they were not there, right? So this is already a complicated kind of, um, kind of uh, di the dialogue that Moses is having with them. So you've seen all these things, yet until this day, the Eternal had not given you a heart to know. There it is in the bold. Live ladat. Until this day, the Eternal had not given you a heart to know, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. So there it is, the knowing heart, the heart that knows things. So let's just stop there and just, just take the phrase, what do you think that means? In, in its context there, what is Moses saying? Like, God has not given you a heart to know. God didn't give that to you until today. Anyone, what does that mean? Does a, how does a heart know things? Okay, Wendy, let's start with Wendy. When I get the sense of knowing, it seems that it's all encompassing. It's not just a sense of love, it's every ounce of my being knows. It's a, a, it's a totality, totality of a person. Their mm. heart, their soul, it encompasses every part of us is what I feel when it's known. And it's also interesting to know somebody also is uh, to be intimate with them in Torah. Okay, good. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. So it could be that the heart is a kind of a stand-in for the whole consciousness the whole being, and also I think Wendy is suggesting, it suggests then that there are, there are many kinds of knowledge 
that this is that this is not just intellectual knowledge, but maybe heart knowledge also. And and actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it's maybe it's only heart knowledge. Maybe this isn't an intellectual thing that Moses is um, is speaking about. Um, okay, let's keep going. Noah. Uh, okay, I I think that he's talking about really knowing heart. He could have used. The, the Torah could have used different words instead of dot. He could have used Zin, could have used just Chacham or Wisdom. Instead it used dot, which it's understanding. It's taking in the knowledge and bringing it back forth in a new way. So I, I think that it's just trying to communicate that we have to take in this knowledge and then bring it forth in our own way so that we can really understand what the text means. Okay. All right. What is da'at? What does it mean to, what is that? Not wisdom, not, what is that da'at? Noah's, Noah's asking us to, to think more about that word. And remember that the word, Wendy already alluded to this, that you know someone in the Bible that's, euf that's, a, that's a euphemism often for sexual intimacy, and that the, the tree of knowledge was the knowledge of good and evil. So that's also, it's not, it's not pure information or wisdom, but a different, perhaps, a different kind of knowledge that the heart is able to grasp. Yonatan? This is a little bit meta, but I feel like a little bit pulled back into Monday's discussion about free will and how kind of the one of the bottom line things that we all agreed on is we might not be able to uh, demonstrate or observe that we have free will, but we all know that we have it, right? That so much of like the way we understand the world is based on, on intuitive knowledge. But that in this passage comes well, on that day, I didn't give you intuitive knowledge. I also didn't give you the ability to observe what you didn't intuitively know. You are muted. So here, uh, I think Yonatan is bringing us not just another nuance in this kind of knowledge, but also um, bringing us to the second, I think, major question here in this phrase. The first, the first question, the one we've been asking is, what does it mean for a heart to know things? How does a heart know things? Is a, is a heart a knowing agent? Because we use the word mind for that. But um, it is also true that in this phrase, it doesn't seem like it is um, our own thinking or knowing, but, but the kind of knowledge that God gives us. Right? God gave you today a heart that knows. So that I think is the other major question that I want us thinking about today is who controls the heart? What, what does it mean that God would give you heart knowledge? Do, do you not get it yourself? And is it just a gift? What, what, what's going on there? Um, uh, how? Um. Oh, okay. So what struck me uh, about this is in terms of the structure of the verse, that the heart to know is equal to eyes to see or ears to hear. In other words, I think we're imposing the primacy of heart because of our own predispositions. But I think the way the verse is structured, it's really putting a heart to know on the same level as more prosaic things like seeing or, or hearing. Okay, that's good, but tell me how, so then what does that mean? What is going, what is, what is the fullness of what Moses is saying God gives us? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm okay. not sure, that's, but yeah. That's, that's fine, that, yeah. that's fine. So this, this, but how's right? It's a heart to know, eyes to see, ears to hear. God gives you all these things. So there's a fullness of perception here that we're talking about, what, what is it exactly? Jamie? Um, <clears throat> I tend to think of uh, the heart as, when we talk about the heart knowing, we're talking about faith or belief. Things that you implicitly trust about the world, 
um, in the same way that you trust your eyes, you trust what you hear, you trust your experience. And that's like, there's a distinction between that and knowledge because you can, you can have things proven to you, but if you don't somehow believe it in your heart, then it doesn't have any ground. And that's not something you can necessarily give to yourself. So I think about like, you can't prove to someone that God does or doesn't exist most of the time. Uh, and I can tell you from personal experience, like <laughs> it's very challenging to try to use evidence to believe in God. Um, and there's all sorts of things like that, um, that you can't change a belief. So you can't change your heart. Um, it's Good. just something that you have. Good. Okay. This is really interesting what's, what, what's emerging in, in this conversation because I think I framed it somewhat simplistically, you know, like is the heart emotional or is it intellectual? Or in the ancient Hebrew, maybe it's both. Maybe we use the term to mean mind as well. And that's what I'm sort of suggesting, you know, as I, as I open here. That maybe sometimes, because they don't, ancient biblical Hebrew doesn't have a word for the mind, the intellect, at least not in the Torah. Right? Later we begin to use seichel in that way. But, so maybe the heart is the whole seed of consciousness that includes both intellectual and emotional life. But actually, when you're reading this phrase, and in Jamie's reading just now, um, it, it, it sounds not like the heart does both the intellectual and the emotional, but that there is a particular kind of knowing that is unique to the heart, that isn't purely intellectual, that is intuitive, that is, um, that is, um, in, 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 it, it is a kind of a, a deep, non-rational uh, kind of knowing, right? And that maybe that kind of knowing, I think Jamie says, is the kind of knowing that one needs in order to forge a covenant with God. It's not like, maybe Maimonides would say is just think about it. How did the world get created? There had to be someone that created the world. Da, 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 da. No, it's like, where's that heart knowledge where you just, you feel it, but you feel know it, right? Okay, um, Arlene. Yeah, I, I thought I thought about a, uh, a few things, but I think it's our discussion on Monday, you can really connect it to free will um, because if you have a connection with God, that's like more like a visceral connection and you know what God wants from you, like you're loving God. So when you can make a choice that is for the good and the choice that could be for you know, the bad, then you're more likely to do the choice for the good because it benefits you and you could serve you know, God more. So I think that's one big connection. And then I think the other one is about passing it down to generations because if you have a heart with God and you feel that closeness and you have children and you have Shabbat and you have all the prayer you bring that joy you know into into it and it goes from generation to generation and better instead of just being secular you have a deeper spiritual meaning good I like that okay two more models here um one which we which we which we, we spoke about uh, before um uh, Noah in some ways pointed us in this direction that the the heart could be the knower of of moral things the knower of good and evil that the heart knows that what is right and wrong that's that's one model and then um Arlene puts us into the context of these this generation trying to remember Hi, uh, the, the 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 movement of of earlier generations place itself in history and that kind of knowledge is a kind of um, a knowledge of one's place in the world, one's journey through history, a sort of knowledge of self and identity and peoplehood. Again, not intellectual, but a, but a knowledge, a knowing. Okay, um, I wanna move forward a little bit here, um, but um, I don't wanna lose, I, I saw Rachel and David had hands up, so I wanna take the, uh, I wanna close out our thinking about just the, the shot, the reading of this verse, and then we're gonna move into other uses of heart in the, in the, in the Torah, so Rachel. Um, it's interesting because there's sort of this idea of like there's what we intellectually know and then our heart seems to have this other truth but for some reason I just when I 
was thinking about that. I was thinking about all the times my heart has just been wrong in a way that my brain actually would not have allowed me to do. And just like, uh, like for me, like I, I will do, I think we all, we make emotional choices intellectually. We, we know if we just thought about it, we wouldn't do. So it's just so interesting to me because I do have this sense of like, that there is something beneath us where like, I know some things and I just know them. It's sort of the way I feel about like, I, I just, I know I'm Jewish. Obviously I am, but I know it. And like the love I have for like my nieces, but it's just this idea of this heart to know. It's like, gosh, if I was, I, you know, there were so many emotional decisions made in the last book that caused so many problems, like big emotional reactions to whether it was like the scouts or the not listening. And so it's almost like, I, I don't know, it's such a different take on that. And, and I, I obviously love when we can, you know, spiritually feel something. It's almost like they have to be in line because I think separately they will lead you in different directions. And I just keep thinking of like, gosh, like, my heart knows, but like, does it? Cause I would love to sit down and have a talk about like how many times she was just wrong. I don't know. It's such a, just something that is sticking with me here in a way that I haven't really thought about it before. Okay, great. That, that's great. Let's not lose the, the binary that we use in, 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 in English uh, at least um, to, uh, between the, the intellect and the emotional. Because even if um, we find that that binary will be um, will be shattered in in ancient Hebrew, it'll at least be a helpful device for us thinking about what exactly is the heart doing. Does the heart perform intellectual tasks? Is the heart the mind as well, or is the heart a, t a separate kind of knowledge? And if that is the case, can we still ask, as Rachel is asking, whether that kind of knowledge, deep as it is, is entirely trustworthy? And is in fact knowledge or just a kind of a, a sense, a kind of a, a, ultimately a feeling, okay? All right, one last comment and then we'll begin to investigate that. David? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it pretty brief. The, what, the, the eyes, ears, these are all part of the seven gates and they go to the brain. And the brain is really where the knowledge is and where everything then gets transmitted everywhere else. Um, and certainly to the heart. The heart, um, in, you know, to me, it almost felt like, God, it's a knowing brain, but the loving heart. So I went to the place of, it's really, heart is, the heart is where the love is. And it's classically throughout history, you know, the heart is love that found, you know, all that kind of stuff. And when in the end, we've learned about injustice, we've, we've taken this whole journey, you've seen miracles, you've seen all this stuff, you have a lot of knowledge, Listen to your heart, because that's where the love is. And uh, as my, as the Beatles said, all you need is love. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. Let's not forget the heart loves and feels, even as we wonder how the heart knows and thinks. Uh, uh, okay. So let's let's take a look. Let's see how heart, at least in a few classic examples, is actually used in in the Tanakh. What is the most famous usage of the heart in all of the Torah? What is the, what springs to mind? Shema. Shema. Yeah. Shema, good. Um, I'm always a little nervous, like, <laughs> it's like someone's gonna say something that's actually more famous. But Shema, I think that's right. The hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart. So let's take a look. This is, this is the, this is, the, this is the classic usage, and I think in some ways this usage fits more nicely into the way that we in English speak about the heart. So here, O Israel, the eternal is our God, the eternal is one. You shall love the eternal, your God, with all of your lev. I'm just going to start using the, the Hebrew now. The cholavavcha, with all of your lev, and with all your soul, and with all your might. So, okay. What, what's going on there? What's the heart doing in, in, the, in this fame? What do you do with your heart there? You love, what, 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 what does that mean? What's the heart up to in the Shema? Is it intellectual? Is it emotional? Is it a feeling? What, 
what's happening there? Is, is this usage different than a heart that knows? Uh, let's see, I see Matt. Well, there is emotional intelligence. So for somebody else was talking about identity and I've known intellectually that I was Jewish since I was about 12, when my grandmother told me. Um, and I would say I only uh, felt that way or because I, yeah, I only felt that way in terms, in my heart, starting about a year and a half ago. And it was a completely, I feel like it was more God that did it than me, which is what, what I think the text is kind of suggesting what you were talking about before. Who put that? Who, okay. Who changed? We're, so we're, this, we're going to get there. We're going to actually spend um, the whole second half of our discussion talking about what's, what God's role is in this. But so far, um, at least in this verse, it, there is an active, you know, human uh, 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 motion, the uh, movement, and the, the movement of loving God. So um, there, it seems like Matt is able to bring some of the earlier descriptions of the heart that we've been kicking around so far into this verse. You should love the Lord your God, meaning you should know, there's a kind of a heart knowledge you should have about God. Is that, what, what do you think? Is that, a, is, that a, is that a fair way to read the hafta? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart? Jack, what do you think? Well, uh, is, uh, the Shema is uh, the voice of a commitment. Uh, to committing your heart, I believe, and that um, with all the, you know, our mind uh, is made up, but our heart says no, um, there's all kinds of literary um, elements that, uh, that humans are, are fickle, we change our minds, uh, we're easily swayed, we're induced to uh, forsake commitments, and this is... Uh, uh, the Torah is telling this one is to be indelible, like in your heart, as if that's the strongest form of commitment. Okay. Devote yourself. Love God, meaning devote yourself to God. Commit yourself to God. Great. As you begin to describe that, though, I must also ask one of the, one of the, the, the real problems with the, with the verse itself, which is how do you force yourself to love God, right? So Jack says, well, that's the point. It's a commitment. You commit. You commit your heart to God. Um, Elizabeth, what do you think? Um, I, I was going to say something very similar to what Jack said, and that it's a matter of actually not thinking about it. Um, the opposite. It's a matter of absolute faith and, and unquestioning in a way. That there's, you know, the, the both in the Ve'ahavta and the Shema, it's a matter of don't question this. This is what you do. Your mind will follow, but your heart's got to be in it 100%. Um, okay. So pretty much what Jack was saying. Okay, great. Okay. So here we're you're using the word love, right? We're using the word heart. This is the classic usage. And it seems like, yeah, we can speak about heart knowledge that, as we've been speaking about before. But on some level, Jack and Elizabeth are taking us to a place that is not really knowing, thinking. It is not intellectual, right? The heart is, it may not be the same um, as the heart in English, but it isn't, it isn't just another word for the, the brain. Okay, I want to now, just for a moment, try to make the case that the heart is the brain, right? That the heart is used in that way as well. So I wanna give you a few examples um, where we really lean into the idea that the heart thinks and knows things and see if um, I, can, I can make the case that the heart is not a different kind of knowledge, but actually is the, or is the, the seat of both, of, of, of both the intellect and the emotion, right? So let's just see. Here is another use uh, of the word from Deuteronomy, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, chapter six of Deuteronomy jump forward to chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, and you have this um, interesting usage, which again has knowledge, vayadata. Know with your lev, know with your heart, that the eternal your God disciplines you 
just as a man disciplines his son. Now, what kind of knowledge is that? that that's, that's knowing, right? You have to know something. You know, know a fact, right? What, what do you think of that one? What do you think of that one? Joni, what do you think? Well, I, th I think we're getting help with the Wehrhafter as we move along about um, Talit team, about the mezuzah. I, th I think that, um, and here are some details that will help you along the way, just in case um, you get distracted. So I, I'm really struck by uh, the practical kind of, it's not just, uh, we say the Shema, and uh, I think the details of what we're given are things that uh, we can touch and feel and uh, can keep us really, really grounded in our daily lives. Okay, good, good, right. I'm, I'm starting to try and push a, a, a use of, of the word lev that could mean intellectual, but it isn't exactly intellectual, is it? It's, but it is, this, like knowing that, um, that the Lord disciplines you the way a parent disciplines a child is a kind of kavana, a kind of intention setting. So the heart can, Joni used the word, focus on things, right? So it might not be intellectual, but the heart is something that can be directed the way the mind, the heart can, can focus on something, can, can, can set its intention towards something, okay? Um, Noah, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I'll agree with everyone and then throw in Naseh the Nishma that will do this loving, will do this knowledge with our body, with everything, and then we'll understand why mm -hmm. we are doing all of this. Do it with our bodies. You know, you remind me, like, let's go back to the Shema. With all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your might maybe actually what we are coming to is that knowledge knowing something this is what wendy said at the very outset knowledge happens with the totality of my being and the lev is is can be used in lots of different ways but it is it's about the the consciousness just the the aware self and you know things in your body and you know things in your feelings and you know things in your mind but all of those are to, to try and parse them out is, is perhaps foolhardy. Wendy, what, what do you think of that? You, you took us there originally. So I wholeheartedly agree. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, there are a few th thoughts that I, I have um, a, a dealing with this. You know, this comes at the end of the cycle of reading Torah. And we're about to go into high holidays, but it's the end of, as far as Torah is concerned, this is the end of our reading till we begin again. And the Israelites are no longer slaves. Now we, and we have been given through the Torah, all these teachings. Now God is saying, okay, now you can have a heart that knows because all of these things that we glean from Torah, now that we are making a decision about not only our feelings, but our actions and how we live totally is a heart that knows, that is beyond what you've known before. The Israelites know, knew how to be feeling and, and react in that manner. But now we are asked to be thoughtful and mindful of what we do. That is the whole point of the mitzvot, is that mindfulness. And that's that knowing. That's what the sense I get. And I had a sense that it's almost like the, um, it's the sixth sense, too. That this is, uh, has uh, that kind of power from, from uh, within the spirit. Yeah. Okay, great. You know, what you're, the kind of like really knowing something that you're describing, I was thinking this when Rachel was talking as well, that there are, there are certain lessons that you don't learn the first time you learn them, right? Like, you, you know it's, or you even, you would admit that it's true, but until you actually really get it, like something really saying, you're like, wow, it really is true.
that every time, you know, every time I, I, I write an email, right, out of, out of frustration, it's always going, you know, it, it's not, a, it's, it's always going to go, go badly. It's not until I actually like am humiliate myself and really learn the lesson of how, you know, I could be told that I could even do it a couple of times, but there's sometimes when it, sometimes when a lesson sinks in completely. And after 40 years, maybe that's the kind of knowledge that they're getting. All right. I feel like in a way we're, I'm starting to kind of beat a dead horse here, just turning around and around and around and around. What are all the meanings of art? And in some ways, you all are saying something very clearly that, I'm, that I keep trying to push back on just for the sake of, of showing nuance. And what you're saying is that the heart knows things in a way that is different from the mind, but it is real knowledge and it is a kind of a, a, a fuller, more intuitive kind of knowledge. Let me just for the sake of, because one of the goals here is just to really see the use of the word. Let me just give you two more examples quickly and then we'll take the comments that are, uh, that are, that are up um, on this question of what the heart is and does and knows. And then I want to turn to the other question um, that is before us today, which is what God's role is in granting that knowledge. But I just want to give you, just for the sake of a full treatment here, I want to give you two of the most um, intellectual or mind-oriented uses of the word heart here, heart here, just to show you how easy it is to use the, the, the word heart in that way. And in fact, the lev, the word is often not translated as heart, but translated as mind. So take a look, just so you, just so you have it, um, um, and, and see if the, this uh, shifts or shapes or nuances you were understanding at all. So later in Tanakh, right, we see in the book of Proverbs that the lev of the wise one makes his speech effective and increases the wisdom on his lips. Okay. So that sounds, oh, you're, you're smart, you're wise, you're, okay, your heart is, is the thing that, that controls your speech and, and increases your wisdom. And then maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the, the paradigmatic example of a, of a, of a mind-like heart is the one that Solomon asks for. King Solomon, known as the wisest of all kings and all, all, all people on earth, um, has this famous moment where, where he asks God for, well, let's take a look. Um, at Givon, the Eternal appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I grant you? You can have anything. And Solomon said, you dealt most graciously with your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in integrity of, of lev, right? Yishrat levav, straight-heartedness. You have continued, that, that's not the usage, though. I, I bolded it, because there it is again, and this word gets used a lot. You have continued this great kindness to him by giving him a son to occupy his throne, as is now the case. And now, my eternal God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am a young lad with no experience in leadership. Your servant finds himself in the midst of the people you have chosen, a people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Grant then your servant an understanding lev, lev shomea, to judge your people, to distinguish between good and bad, for who can judge this vast people of, your, of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this and indeed granted him that lev. So I just want to throw those out as, uh, as reference points for thinking about the heart as something that functions a lot like, I mean, a lot like the mind. King Solomon, the wisest of all people, didn't have a big brain. He had a big heart, right, or big lev. So, okay, so just uh, this is our last cycle of, of processing the meaning of the word heart, and then we're going to move to the second question. Ari and then Hannah. Yeah, it might be a bit of an American conception, but we have the conception of the heart already knows, right? Like a lot of our lexicons are listen to your heart or follow your heart as something that's unchanging or something that's eternally true or something that lies beneath that we often talk our ways around or fail to recognize or, or, um, ruminate around and talk ourselves out of and it, it strikes me that in the passage um in the beginning they already know right they've already seen what you know or at least their ancestors have seen what god has done it's to me it's almost a question of opening their heart to what they already know mm -hmm. or um uh you know i remember in the bible the, the pharaoh has a hard heart right this is almost like a soft heart it's 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 accepting what's already inside um is a heart to know and, and in that sense maybe it, it a heart to know again this might be more the american 
Lex, but it might not be no in mental knowledge so much as no is in, um, uh, you know, the way I know someone else, right? In recognition, in, in more Ken kind of a way. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, Ari's giving us a perfect bridge between our two questions here. Because Ari's suggesting that the heart, the way that the heart knows something, it, it's like, it's as if it's been there all along. It's, a, it's almost like a discovery of what was deep in there. And that you might see as God granting you that kind of illumination, right? That kind, uh, that kind of, there's something that happens almost without your, without your control or, or, or direction. Okay, um, Hannah. Hello, hello. I'm unconvinced by your intellectual arguments. And I know you're shocked. I had to just, you know, continue my consistency. Okay, here's the thing. I've been thinking a lot about, and maybe this is later in your source sheet, if so, I apologize, um, about the earlier part of Devarium where it says circumcise your hearts and the understanding of what does it mean to make yourself more vulnerable, more available in some way, more accessible. And that in that same verse, it, it, sh it, sh it kind of splits up into circumcise your heart and then also stop being stiff-necked. And so it kind of gives us this dichotomy again of heart isn't the same as mind, heart isn't the same totally as logic or as rational thinking or intellectualizing. And I think there's a third, it's a third kind of knowing that, but it can't actually just be the same as mind or intellectualizing because we have too many examples where it's other. It comes up in the Talmud in a lot of places as, or in other kinds of commentary as other forms also. But I think there's this kind of third space where you have this intellectual knowing, which is fully what we would call brain. And then you have this other knowing, which we would call in our understanding heart, which is just kind of like completely irrational, completely untethered feeling that overtakes you and you can't make any kind of rational decision from that place. It's like when you're first in love or when you're in some space of lust or something that you really have no control over. And then Lev, I think, operates in a third space, which is the joining of these things, which is maybe closer to some quiet voice inside yourself, some knowing, some gut instinct, some connection with what your understanding of God is, where you're able to meld both of those things and you understand fully, this is right because I know it intellectually vaguely and I know it in my body vaguely and in this kind of emotional way vaguely. And all of that combines to give me this understanding that's much deeper than either of those other options gives me. And what I love about the understanding of biblical Lev is that it's all of that. It's not actually one or the other, but it's the third space. Good, beautiful, beautifully, beautifully put, elegantly put. And you, you, we, we will see an example of the mo model you gave us, the circumcising of the heart. But that, I think, that that model echoes some of what Ari was suggesting, which is that the heart might be something that needs to be uncovered, revealed. Like there's a kind of opening of the heart that will that will bring forth. But um, but uh, your a uh, strong suggestion that even in the examples I gave, that's, this is not intellectual. After all, what we're talking about is wisdom. We're talking about the ability to know good and evil, to discern between right and wrong. All the things we've been saying all along, and as I say, I feel like at this point, I'm just belaboring the question, but just as a way of affirming um, what you all have said and what Hannah just, just said, that the, the bothness or the, the three, the all threeness of the heart, um, it is worth looking, and you know, I like to do this. The very first usage of the word heart in the Torah, um, I don't know if anyone knows, I wouldn't have guessed this, but it's quite striking. The Torah is so good to us because she gives us actually both valences in quick succession. So this is, um, this. Just, just take a look at it. We'll, we'll conclude our investigation of the meaning of the heart and the function of the heart with this, um, this beautiful passage where God um, is reflecting on the corruption and crime that, that, that God sees throughout humanity um, um, early on in Genesis. And, um, and God says, uh, my screen share is not working? Yeah, here. God says, check, check this out. This is, this is just before the, the flood. 
And the Eternal saw how great was man's wickedness on earth. Oh, I usually translate that. Was humanity's wickedness on earth. And how every plan designed by his lev was nothing but evil all the time. Kol yetzer machshavot libo. Rak ra kolayom. So that's interesting. It really does sound like a mind because it plans and has thoughts. But it is also a kind of an intuition because it has a yetzer, a desire. Right? But, so that's, that's the kind of, like, if you're going to translate it, you might translate it as mind. But uh, then the next verse has the eternal regretting that, um, regretting having made people on earth and God's lev was saddened. elibo. So you see, like, the, the, the heart thinks and has thoughts, but the heart also gets sad and has feelings. And... God has a heart, which is a whole separate conversation. But yes, yes to the bothness, yes to the allness of what the heart does. And I think um, at this point we have sufficiently treated the, 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 the manifold uses of the, of the word heart. Maybe not sufficiently, but for now, sufficiently. Let's turn now to the other question. And Ari was already pointing us here. And Ari gave us, I was going to like set this up by saying, if the Shema is the most famous use of, heart, of, of the word heart in the Torah, what is the second most famous? But Ari already took us there. And I think this is probably, if you had to like, you know, family feud, the, the second like most answered, where is heart used in the, in the Torah? It would probably be um, in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And this brings us back to the question that we start, one of the questions we started with, because God gave us this uh, this heart. Until this day, the Eternal had not given you a heart to know. What does it mean that God gave us his heart? So let's think a little bit more about God's role in the heart's work. And we've got um, th this, on, uh, this kind of classic uh, uh, image of, I will harden Pharaoh's lev, ani akshet et lev paro, that I may multiply my signs and marvels in the land of Egypt. So, wow, God can control how our heart works. But it's important whenever we're talking about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart to remember that though God threatens that and God does that, there are also many instances during the plagues where it seems like Pharaoh's also doing it, right? By chabed paro et libo, but Pharaoh made his lev heavy. This time also would not let the people go, okay? So... What, what, when you, when you, when you read that story, God hardening Pharaoh's heart, or maybe Pharaoh hardening his own, what is, what are we meant to take away from, and now we've got another instance of it later in Deuteronomy, where God grants you a certain kind of heart, is the Torah suggesting that God shapes our heart, that God controls our heart, what, what do you, what do you think about that, what, what's, what's God's role in our verse in Deuteronomy, or just in the larger workings of the heart in the Torah, um, Yonatan. starting to think from all these texts <clears throat> that Lev kind of functions as an interface um, between two agents, and that can be between two people, or that can be between a person and God, and that, you know, I'm on one side, and the other person's on the other side, and then we interface at our Levs, um, and kind of in the nature of an interface is I can change what happens on my side and that affects what is and is not compatible on the other side, right? So that doesn't mean that necessarily I'm directly changing the other person's heart, but I'm changing the, the, the parameters of what that can look like. Okay, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. God has a role, or, or, and, and, and for God, you could also substitute just sort of the forces beyond our control. Like the heart, God, there's some sort of working on our heart, but we also have a role. We also, like an interface, right? We, we the, the heart actually might be a place where we meet God. And we shape the heart and God shapes the heart. And it's almost like a kind of a stage for this, um, this, this working, this figuring, this sort of working out of our consciousness, right? So that when when we know things, we have to focus and know them and 
and intuit them, but also like we have, God is also playing a part here. Um, let me give you a couple of other strong examples of God. These are some classic examples of God fiddling with the heart. And then I wanna hear more reflections like the one Yonatan just gave us. But take a look, here are some, um, some famous, uh, from the Psalm, some famous examples of God shaping the heart. Fashion a pure lev for me, O God, create in me a steadfast spirit. Right? Lev tahor varali, create for me a pure heart. What is that request? Right? You, God, make me a pure heart. I mean, we're, we're, all of our um, learning this month is like with one eye towards the, the holidays and the month of Elul and the spiritual work. Is part of the work that we're doing, are we asking God to make us feel things? Are we asking for God's help to open our hearts? Well, what, is, what does that mean? And, and here, just a, another example, and even perhaps even stronger example, and uh, from Ezekiel, and I will give you a new lev, and I will put a new spirit into you. I will remove the lev of stone from your body and give you a lev of flesh. So could, could I ask that? Could that be my, 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 my um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur work? Is like, you, God, make me, make me a better heart. Make me a purer heart. Make me a good heart. My heart's no good. You give me the knowledge, the love, the wisdom. You do it. Okay? All right, Jamie, what do you think? I uh, just wanted to throw an example out there uh, from my own life, if I might. Um, I've spent a long time believing in my gut somewhere that eating meat in the way that I do is wrong and the way that we do in America is wrong. And I've done a lot of the intellectual work. I've researched it. I've watched Meet Your Meat videos. I've done all, I've done the intellectual work. I've done the gut work. I've talked about it. I've tried to institute practices for t at certain times. You know, I've lived a more vegetarian life and yet I still, when it comes down to it, will eat meat largely in the way that I have. So that I guess is that live part that somehow seems a little bit out of my control. Just, and yeah, I would ask God, you know, change my heart, right? Soften my heart in this instance because I know that this is wrong. Um, so that's, that's, that's a re that's a, that's a really uh, wonderful example. I really thank you for that because it, it be we're beginning to synthesize a, a, a lot of this conversation. That is, we spoke earlier about the heart knowing things in a way that, in a deeper way, in an intuitive way that the intellect can't. And that actually, that actually may um, bring us to God's role in the shaping of the heart. We can know things are wrong. We can know things are not working for us. We can, know, we can know these lessons, but how do we get to that real deep in your bones knowledge, in your heart knowledge? Then we might have to turn to God. I know that I shouldn't be eating as much meat as I'm eating. God, help me know that in a way that, that, it, I, that I can live it out. Help me know it in that deep way that it's, help me, right? Th that's when we might be, help me know the things I already know, but know them in my heart, right? Um, David, what do you think? Well, um, am I unmuted? Yeah, I, I think. Um, wow. Um, so I love what Wendy had to say, and I wanted to amplify, you know, just that this is um, Moses' farewell address. I liken it to Washington's farewell address. And, he, and, the, and it can all be, it's just remember, 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 remember. And, you know, and, Going back to what, the, what you said at the very beginning, so Moses said, remember what Pharaoh did. And of course, none of the people there had the experience of remembering it. So they must have remembered it ancestrally or collectively or somehow, you know, somehow it, it got in memory. So that's that, that heart that they all have. Now, in going back to, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, you know, Pharaoh doesn't have the same heart. He's got a whole so I'm going to go into the ancestry. I know, and how is he? How is God going to do it? 
he's going to attack his gods. They, they worship gods of nature, they, you know, the sun, the sun god, the moon god, all that kind of thing. And it's exactly what all the plagues did. So the agency of God is what I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of lack, latching on to, which I think is the direction you were going. And what we're asking for is that same trust and faith in God directing and guiding our heart. Yeah, I love that. That makes sense. I mean, I, I, it was kind of a long way to get there, but... Um. You know, I, mean, I love that because I think what, what you know, as, as we read that God ga- can give a, no- a, a heart that knows, right, the question is, well, how does, how does that happen? Does God communicate messages? Does God um, transmit knowledge to our heart? But as you're describing it through the, 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 the Pharaoh narrative, it, God... God granting knowledge is, is, is a way of saying um, that the world continues to function and things happen. And as we move through the world happening to us, that's how we begin to gain this knowledge. We gain it through the experience of living in this world and experiencing the world as it, God is, is the world itself giving us new information, new experiences. 40 years of journeying through the desert. That's how God gave the knowledge. God didn't just do, 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 put it in your heart. God is the force that has been teaching you throughout the, your whole life, throughout your whole journey. That's, the, that's the, the role that God is playing in shaping your heart. But how did he harden Pharaoh's heart then? Right. Well, in that model, it's that God doesn't give Pharaoh the requisite experience or knowledge or, right? God withholds from Pharaoh the kind of knowledge that would allow, right? I, I, this, that, the question of God hardening Pharaoh's heart is one that we should spend an entire hour on, so I, I can't answer it here, but it is, it's tricky, isn't it? Um, okay, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, so I want to just uh, I, I want to just offer two last models for thinking about how God works on the heart or how the heart works, and one is is Hannah's already pointed us towards, which is the language of um, of, of circumcising the heart. Right? Then the eternal. This is also in Deuteronomy. Then the eternal your God will. This is the next chapter, right? We started in chapter twenty nine. Uh, up here, God has given you a heart to know. And then in the next chapter, we, we, we use a different metaphor that God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring to love the eternal, your God, with all your lev and soul in order that you may live. Now, uh, Hannah already did this for us, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna um, say too much about it, but it is an inter- as we wonder about the role that God plays, it is interesting to think of in this metaphor, God is the one that cuts something off that occludes the heart, God allows the heart to be open, but God doesn't, it, then the heart knows, right? If, if God could just remove whatever's blocking the heart, then the heart would know. So maybe it isn't God controlling the heart as, 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 as it was back in, uh, in the days of Pharaoh, but God sort of cleaning off the, the, the stuff that is blocking us, right? So that's, that's one model. And then the last model I just wanted to, um, to throw out before we close is um, because we are in the month of Elul, right? Elul, which has been famously associated with the verse in the Song of Songs, Ani Dodi, Dodi Lili, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I can't help but, um, I don't want to leave off without including the most beautiful um, use, perhaps, of, of the heart in, in biblical literature, um, which is in the love poem of the Song of Songs, um, where the beloved is spoken of um, as knocking on the door, and um, this famous uh, verse, which has been turned into song, um, I was asleep, but my lev, my heart, was awake. The sound of my beloved knocks, let me in, my sister, my darling, my purest dove, for my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. This phrasing is so fascinating to me. I was asleep. I was out of it. I was tuned out. I didn't, I didn't hear God. I didn't connect to God. I didn't, when God knocked or when my beloved knocked, I didn't hear it, but my heart was awake, right? Which is, a, that is also a model in which I'm not entirely in control, but it isn't exactly like God's in control either. It's that the heart has a mind of its own, 
right? The heart is conscious in a way that maybe my mind is not conscious. My body is not conscious. Other parts of me are not conscious, but I, um, I can trust my heart to be awake, right? And that is, an, that's, that is a model which I find very compelling, right? Th this model of circumcise my heart is, is a model we've considered where, where I call out to God, God help me. God fashion my heart. God make me make me a heart that is that is open, that is aware, right? But this model is almost like trust your heart. Your heart is awake. Your heart is awake. Your heart is listening, right? So that I, I offer to us also to keep our hearts keep our hearts awake during this period. To trust the alertness of our hearts. To cultivate the alertness of our hearts. And and this um, this uh, this last verse has a beautiful, uh, beautiful song that we sing. Um, so maybe we'll just close with that. Ani shayna belibie, belibie, koldo di dofek pitrili. Ani shayna belibie, belibie, koldo di dofek pitrili. Achoti rayati onati tamati Sheroshe nimletal kibut sotet nisi se laila Achoti rayati onati tamati Sheroshe nimletal kibut sotet nisi se laila Too many syllables in that last bit there, but you, you get my point. Just keep your hearts awake, folks. It is, uh, it's a time to stay awake. Um, thanks. This is a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate everybody's thoughts today. Uh, see you later in the week. See you next week. Is there a cl there's class next week? There's class next week. We're going to do uh, my, my, my classes. The Monday class is shut down for as we head into the holidays. Tuesday class, we're going to have one more of on Tuesday. The Parsha class is going all the way through. We're never, ne the, never going to stop doing this. Never. We're always in the Parsha. Always in the Parsha. So, um, so I'll see you next Wednesday and then the Wednesday after that forever and ever. Okay? All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.